we've made our way down these long stairs to get to this place. If you look around us, you can tell that this was a quarry even from the time of the Iron Age and was still used in the Roman times. Eventually, it was abandoned because the rock wasn't good enough to continue building. But what makes this place venerated, as you can see from the frescoes that are protected behind this glass, here behind me, this one, even of the cross of Jesus, these are ancient frescoes indicating that this place was venerated by the Christians. Why is it special? Well, the statue right here tells us why it's special. You see a woman with a crown on her head and she's holding a cross. If you're familiar with symbolism and iconography, that's very clearly the Empress Helen, Constantine's mother. Now she was a Christian. She was originally from, they think Bithynia, um, was the mother of Constantine the Great. So she became the Empress, uh, mother of the emperor, the empress mother. And so she wielded a lot of power over her son who eventually became emperor and uh, dictated the Edict of Milan in 313. That means that Christians were no longer persecuted, but she went beyond that. She had great influence over her son. And because of a number of things that happened in you know, the empire, um, Constantine brought together a lot of different people to talk about and to define what the faith was. And this was the Council of Nicaea. Now, one of the participants in that council, one of the reference point was the bishop right here in Jerusalem. His name was Macarius. Macarius. And he was really outspoken because he made it very clear, living here in Jerusalem, that the Arian heresy was completely wrong. No, he was contemporary with Helen, that's why I'm mentioning him. Arianism simply was the belief that, you know, in very simple words, that um, the son was not equal to the father. And if you look at the Nicene Creed, it specifies exactly that. The father and the son are God. They're equal. So you think, how would he know that? He knew this place. He knew where Jesus was crucified. He knew where he was buried. In fact, it was, according to tradition, him who helped Helen to find the cross. She came over here in 326. Apparently, he had received a letter from the emperor saying, if you find the most um, holy relics, I don't think they used the words relics back then, but these items that have to do with the passion of Christ, of Jesus, who is equal with God the Father, tell me, and we will give them the honor that they are due. And it was from that that he sent also the indications that he would build a church. So it was not only here that he built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it was also in the place of the Nativity. It was in the place of Mamre uh, in Hebron, where um, Abraham lived and was visited by the angels. These were the places that thanks to Helen, Constantine began to build the churches under the direction of the Bishop Macarius here, Macarius. So why in this place do we have Helen holding the cross? Well, the tradition says that, well, you can even see the ancient maps. In this place where we are standing is an ancient cistern. That's like a hole or in a ground. And it would make sense because if you're going to, um, you know, take the rock out of here, you, you have holes, you know, it's because you actually make the holes to take the rock out to build. And so it would be a perfect place just to put refuse. You can see that even today in different places in the Holy Land. So just a few steps away on a little hill, which back in the time of Christ was outside of the city walls, was the, the hill of Calvary. That was a place where they had crucifixions. And so the logical place to put the refuse, the trash, the garbage from that area, including other things, I imagine, would be right here. And so when Helen came over, and Macarius, of course, knew the Christians, he knew the people here, and they started investigating Okay, who has these things from Christ's passion? You can think even today, pious women mostly will not let things be lost. It says in the gospel that it was the women who were at the foot of the cross that saw everything. In my mind's eye, I can imagine, you know, as they wrap up Jesus' body in the shroud and they're taking him to lay him in the tomb, collecting those nails, collecting the crown of thorns, taking that 
sign which says, the King of the Jews. Taking these elements and keeping them, you're not even really sure why. A little bit of investigation, a little bit of uh, speaking to the people here, understanding the traditions of where people prayed. This is how they found this place. In fact, right up these stairs in this main chapel, which is the Armenian chapel called the Chapel of Helen, behind a door, they actually have an inscription in the wall. And that inscription says, we are here with Christian symbols, I believe, of a fish and a boat. What does that say? In the time when Hadrian built this, built actually a Greek a temple here over this space because he was so tired of the Jews when he destroyed the temple and made this into a Roman city. He says, excuse me, not, they weren't, it wasn't a Greek temple, it was a Roman temple. He says, I'm just gonna get rid of all this memory of all the tips of different types of Jews. Christians were considered a type of Jew and I'm gonna build this Roman uh, temple. So the Christian said, hmm, even though they're, they're worshiping a Roman God, I'm gonna say that I know who the true God is and I'm here. So there's a lot of things which point to this place. And of course, later when the Crusaders said, we're gonna make this and honor this place when they regained access for the Christians to come to the Holy Land, you can see you know, just thousands upon thousands of crosses that have been inscribed on the walls coming down here because they knew the tradition. Now, if you read the story, it's just a lot of legend, I suppose. But one of the things they have very clear is in this area, they found a lot of things, a lot of wood. And so Helen said, how are we gonna know if one of these pieces of wood is the piece of wood, you know, where Jesus, the top beam, where Jesus was crucified? You can ask the Holy Spirit. And so there are two stories, one saying that a boy who had died, different pieces of this wood touched him. When one piece, one piece of this wood touched him, he came back to life. There's a story of Macarius, the bishop here, who, had, uh, who knew one of the women who was very ill. Same thing. Different pieces of wood, refuse here. She touched all of it. The same piece of wood that she touched cured her. So they said, this is the wood of the cross. At least it's in this area, in the same place. Is it the exact wood of the cross? We don't know. But it was this wood that was taken and venerated and even dispersed, even in the fourth century. And this is the same century that they started to build this church all around Christendom. You can see some of these gorgeous reliquaries with the true cross. Even on Palm Sunday is when people receive the blessing of that wood, even today. Up in the chapel of Adam, right underneath Calvary because Jesus is the new Adam. He's the one that saves us from original sin. They have a relic of this piece of wood. So this is where it comes from. You know, you have that snide remark of people saying, oh, if we had put together all the splinters of the true cross from all over the world, we would have thousands and thousands of crosses. Don't be so quick to believe that. You can make little tiny relics from a, a cross beam of wood. And also what's interesting about this tradition is if you go to the church of the Santa Croce, which means Holy Cross in, in Latin, the church of Santa Croce in Jerusalem, that used to be Helen's palace right next to the church of St. John Lateran. In that place, they venerate the relics of the cross. This is where you can see the sign which has Jesus, uh, king, or excuse me, the King of the Jews. You can see one of the nails that pierced his hands. You know, tradition says that Helen when she talked to the Christians and obtained those nails as the mother of the empress, she actually put one in, I think it was, on the bridle of Constantine's horse or something like that to help him in, ba in battle. But you can see those things there. This is a tradition that goes back 1,700 years. Where did she find it? Right here. In fact, the, there's three lamps right here in a little kind of opening to the top to my right. Tradition says that's when Helen first looked down into this place, when they told her, we have found wood here. We have found three large pieces of wood. Come and see. So this takes us back to the reality of this day and the reason that we're here in this holy triduum. We've come from freedom um, that has been given to us, won for us in that Garden of Gethsemane by Jesus in his abandonment to the Father and now we see freedom made real in love. Thanks to the wood of the cross. Here to my left, actually, there's a place that's lit up always. You have a place where you can put candles. 
because they say when Helen was looking down, this is where they found all the wood in this part of the cistern. So people venerate that place. Even now there was a man who came and just kissed that place. And it's like what we do on Good Friday. Perhaps in his heart he was saying, Hail, O cross, our only hope. Why is it our only hope? Oof, there's many reasons why. But the main reason is because this is what makes us free. You know, we talked several times during our pilgrimage of freedom that Moses was a prefigurement of Christ in many ways. We can even think when we were just a couple of days ago on Mount Nebo, that cross raised up looking out over the Holy Land with a snake on the pole. We look at it, or, you know, the ancient Israelites looked at it, and they were cured from the bite of a snake. When we look at the cross and we venerate that cross, what happens to us? Well, the cross is a horrible thing. It's a gruesome thing. It's a terrible thing. In fact, Constantine actually made it illegal at one point because it was just so horrible. The very first centuries of Christendom, they never used it as a symbol of Christianity because it was related simply to a terrible death. But it was after the discovery of this place and the building of the Holy Sepulcher that it became the symbol of Christianity because they recognized in it freedom. Freedom because it's a total self-giving in love. So Jesus, this new Moses, who was placed on just a hilltop, Calvary is just a little hilltop. Uh, And what did he receive from God? In his flesh, he showed the new law of love. He fulfilled that in his body. If you look at the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, it speaks about this, that Jesus was firmly resolved to proceed toward Jerusalem. These words, firmly resolved, is a glimpse into Christ's freedom. He chose it. He wanted to do this. What was moving him? That he was chained to his father's will that he abandoned himself to over in the Garden of Gethsemane? I would say rather, just like Macarius, he was God, just like God the Father. Two separate wills, right? The human will in Jesus, right? And his divine will. But what filled his heart is love, love for each and every one of us. It's love for the people that wrote, that uh, led Moses up to Mount Sinai to intercede for them. It's love that led Jesus to the hill of Calvary. He was firmly resolved. He knew that in Jerusalem, death on a cross would await him. But he went in obedience to the Father. He went because his heart was filled with love. He achieves his own freedom as a conscious decision motivated by love. Because you can ask yourself, who is freer than the Almighty? What binds him? Who binds him? No one and nothing. And so he lived his life as a service, a service of love. And if you think about the definition of love, what is it? It's self-giving. That's the key. Freedom in love. Like human life itself, freedom draws its meaning from love. It's the meaning of life. It's what everyone longs for. So who is the freest? Someone who selfishly keeps uh, all of his possibilities open or the person who selflessly gives himself to others at the service of others? Now. The Apostle Paul writes when he's uh, writing to the Christians in in Galatia, he says, you are called to freedom, my brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. This is what the cross teaches us. So living according to the flesh, if you're looking at St. Paul, means following the selfish tendencies of human nature. Living according to the Spirit, and that means the Spirit that was the love in the Son, the love in the Father's heart, and the Spirit that fills each and every one of us from Pentecost. Living according to the Spirit, as St. Paul says, means allowing oneself to be guided in intentions and in works by God's love, which Christ has given to us. So Christian freedom, what is it? It's the opposite 
of arbitrariness, of complete, total, do whatever you want. It rather consists of, a lo- of following Christ in the gift of self. And even up to the point of sacrifice and sacrifice on a cross. So this is exactly what this place leads us to as we're at this point of our pilgrimage of freedom. I just want to repeat a prayer that Pope Benedict XVI led at the end of the Way of the Cross. He said, uh, several years ago, he said, let us ask ourselves, um, what have we done with this gift of freedom? One for us from the cross. What have we done with the revelation of the face of God in Christ from the cross who was suffering so much? With the revelation of God's love that conquers hate? Many in our age, he says, do not know God and cannot find him in the crucified Christ. Many are in search of a love or a liberty that excludes God. Many believe that they have no need of God. And then he says, dear friends, after looking at the cross and Jesus' passion, allow this sacrifice on the cross to question us, to question you, Let us permit him to put our human certainties in crisis. Let us open our hearts to him. Jesus is the truth that makes us free to love. Let us not be afraid of dying. The Lord saved us. He saved all of us. And then he says, uh, quoting Peter, um, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body upon the cross that we might die to sin and live in righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. This is the truth of Good Friday. This is what makes us free. In his death, he overcame our death that comes through sin, and therefore we have new life. So now what I'm going to share with you are some of the images we'll see and we'll live today. It's a ceremony here in the Holy Sepulcher. Happens once a year where they take the body of Jesus. It's a, like a sculpture, um, but it's movable. And so they process with the cross up to Calvary on the place where that cross was placed into the rock, which is underneath the Greek Orthodox altar. And in silence, even though there's crowds, they take out the nails, they take off the crown of thorns, and they place that body into a shroud. They process it down to the place where they would have anointed the Lord's body. They anoint it, they cover it with the shroud, and they take it in to the Holy Sepulcher, and they lay it there in great hope, waiting for the resurrection. So united in prayer together from this blessed place, this holy place, let's unite ourselves too with this intention of Helen, of Saint Helen, who said, let us find this cross because it is what has blessed the entire human race. It is truly what has made us free. Hail, O cross, our only hope. So know that our team here has prayed for you from this place, from the Holy Sepulcher, and I hope you can join us again tomorrow as we wait together, speaking about the freedom in hope, together with Mary outside of the tomb. And may God bless you. Alors les prêtres des Juifs dirent à Pilate, il ne fallait pas écrire « roi des Juifs », il fallait écrire « cet homme a dit, je suis le roi des Juifs ».